Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fair Data 101 Express course, virtual course. My name is Liz Stokes, and very soon I'll stop being so nervous and relax into the first of our live Q&A sessions uh, for this course. So thank you so much for joining us. Looks like we've got um, 99 people here, which is a nice number. Um, in, in Australia, we have a convention to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. So for me, uh, living in the inner west of Sydney, this is acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd also like to pay respect to the elders past and present as the traditional custodians of knowledge, knowledge in this land and welcome any First Nations people that are here today. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here today. Uh, I know that the FAIR data principles can appear a bit like a jungle, but if you look closely, you'll notice there's a little path in there. Um, and I hope over the next four weeks, um, we will uh, we'll be able to encourage you to um, uh, enjoy the wide variety of ecosystem uh, ecosystems that we find among the FAIR data principles. Um, if you can hear some noises, it's actually my dog um, who is noticing that there might be some activity outside. I apologise for that. She's very nice otherwise. So let's go, um, let's go for a walk um, among the, the wonderful, rich jungle that is the FAIR data principles. So today we're going to focus on findability and we have um, assembled a fine panel of people from the ARDC who are going to tell you a few stories about um, the FAIR data principles. Before we get into that though, I'd really like to share our hopes for you in this course and just give it a bit of an outline so we have a sense of what this course, what's happening in this course and what to expect over the next four weeks. So our hopes for you are that you'll be familiar with the concept of FAIR data and its application in research, that you'll gain experience with technologies, services and tools for making data FAIR, many of which are provided by your very own Australian Research Data Commons, uh, and also that you will be able to identify best practice examples of FAIR data management. Uh, this is the second time we've run this course and we're doing things a little differently to keep it interesting. We've opened up unlimited registration and also shortened the course. So hopefully this month long thing will keep things manageable for you. It, what it does mean is that we have a wonderful array of expertise and different experiences across your cohort. We know that people are joining both to, um, to learn about FAIR data for the first time and also to take, um, take a, undertake a refresher. Uh, let me share with you Ah, so these are the components of this course. Um, so there is a course website and I encourage you very strongly to bookmark that link, which um, I, I hope that you have access to already, because this has all of the links to all of the course materials across the course. Um, over the next four weeks, there will be two webinars, a set of activities and a quiz for you to do. And we will do a live Q&A session just like this every Wednesday. There's also a Slack workspace and we've had several people join already. I think we're, we've just hit over the 100 participant um, mark there. Uh, and it is really lovely to see people introducing themselves and starting to get stuck into some um, really good discussion there on um, findability. Uh, you'll notice at the, on this screen, I've also included a link to our code of conduct. Um, so because we, um, we understand that learning is a social activity, we have a code of conduct um, that we require all participants to follow. So I recommend you um, copy this link and um, have a read of our code of conduct um, because I think it's up to all of us to uh, uphold a safe and respectful learning environment and ensure that our social interactions create spaces in which everyone feels empowered to learn. 
So if you feel that the code of conduct has been breached in any way, there's a link on that um, code to a reporting form which goes direct to the ARDC and we'll follow up on that promptly. So our findable today experts um, are um, uh, Natasha Simons, from, who's the Associate Director of Data and Services at the Australian Research Data Commons. We have Siobhan McCafferty, Project Manager for ARDC and um, PIDS enthusiast, and also Keith Rush Russell, who's the Manager of our Engagement Team. Um, Radio. So now um, it's probably time for me to stop blathering on. This concludes the guided proportion um, of our introduction now. And I'm going to hand over to Natasha, Siobhan and Keith to share some stories about how the ARDC um, facilitates findability in relationship to the, um, to the fair data principles. So I'll run these um, I'll run their presentations all together and then we'll open up for questions. So um, feel free to pop questions into the question component or the chat uh, in your go to meeting um, and we will we'll take it on from there. <clears throat> Thanks, Liz. Wait till you pass me a screen share. Yes. Oh, that's right. I need to scroll. Okay. Okay. Just let me go into present mode. Okay, great. So thank you, Liz, and welcome everybody. Really nice to have you here. So the State of Open Data Survey, which is a survey conducted by Pigshare and Digital Science, and it's been conducted each year since 2016. In, 20, in 2019, they had more than 8,000 participants in that survey from more than 190 countries. And they asked the question, which circumstances would motivate you the most to share your data? What do you think the answer was? So the top answer at 62% was the increased impact and visibility of my research. And then coming in next at 60% was for the public benefit. In other words, researchers want the data they share to be findable. And this is where the fair data principles come in. So the fair data principles give us a framework for making data findable, specifically mentioning rich metadata, the use of identifiers and exposure of data descriptions in an index or searchable resource. So I'm going to talk about Research Data Australia, which is an ARDC search engine for Australian research data collections that speaks to a number of points on the findable aspects of FAIR. So Research Data Australia helps you find, access and reuse data for research. It caters for researchers, policymakers, educators, business people and the public. It's more than just a search engine. It enables you to reuse existing data, to explore beyond your discipline and to assemble data resources to solve big problems. So it's interesting that the number, the number of the day appears to be 99. That was the number of people who came in in the first part of this webinar. I think it's in, increased now. But 99 is also the number of contributing sources into Research Data Australia. And they're contributed by organisations across Australia. So there are 144,126 uh, collection of collections of data records in Research Data Australia, as well as um, collections of software, um, references to re researchers, services, as well as grants and projects. Okay, it's important to note as well that we don't store the data itself in Research Data Australia. We provide links to the data um, that are provided, the records are provided by those contributing organisations and the links go back to the data sets that are held in their collections. So we don't all have open data in this either. Um, it's a mix of descriptions about data as well as um, links to open data. 
Okay, so for the fourth year in a row since the State of Open Data Survey and Report were, initiate, were initiated, uh, data citations were listed as the holy grail in terms of rewards for data sharing. So researchers who share their data want it to be seen, heard, they want it to stand out from the crowd, they want it to be understood, to have impact, and they want to be acknowledged as the creators because that helps improve the visibility of themselves and their research. RDA helps researchers improve their citation counts by making their data more findable and we include a cite this feature on each, day, on each page of the data collections. We also have PID services at ARDC, PID meaning persistent identifier, which is also mentioned in that findable aspect of FAIR. So we can issue DOIs, uh, digital object identifiers which can help with, with the arrow, you can see it's the 10 dot number there, and that is key to data citation as they're used to track data impact. Um, so on this page as well, you can see that we also, sorry, my control panels just in the view of that, um, you can also see that um, we show in Research Data Australia the number of data citations, and that's through a link um, bet between Research Data Australia and the, it says Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index, but it's now owned by Clarivate. Um, okay, so Research Data Australia also improves the connections of Australian research data. So it's really important that data is discovered in context. If you just find a data set and you don't know much more than the data set description, it's not going to not going to help you too much. You really need the the link to the publication that 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 um, talks about the findings and analysis of the research data. You need a link to the researchers who produced the data and the article. You need a link to the samples that were collected or a description of the samples that were collected during the course of the research. Um, you need a link to the research organisation that the researchers are connected to, a link to the software, the underlying software perhaps from the, from the data collection, to the project itself as well as to the funding uh, bodies that um, that were able to fund that research and Research Data Australia enables all those things to be collected and to be connected in the metadata records. So Research Data Australia also takes information as inputs that those data collection records they come in from institutions as well as records from funding organisations um, like the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council and then they're pushed out as well to places like Google so they they increase your the findability of data in Google just by being in Research Data Australia. Um, we also feed out to the data site. Uh, they're the organisation that mints digital object identifiers. They also have a search interface. And through those things, we also are able to exchange information with um, publishers as well. So that when somebody search for an article in the Scopus database, for example, the link goes back for the underlying data held in a repository and that's through contributing that information into Research Data Australia, it's fed into all of those services. So just to sort of wrap up with a data impact story. So I started by saying that the top motivators for sharing data were impact and visi visibility of research as well as for public benefit and this is a really good example. So Professor Anne Cuss from the School of Public Health at the University of Sydney led a study into the link between sunbed use and melanoma. Melanoma, and she found that young people are especially sensitive to sunbed UV radiation. So she, her team did some modelling and they estimated that banning sunbeds would reduce the number of melanoma cases in New South Wales alone by 120 per year. And as a result of that, that research was pivotal to the New South Wales government banning commercial sunbeds from the end of 2014 with other Australian states and overseas places following suit. So this research was the winner of the Sachs Institute's Research Action Awards in 2015, recognising the impact the study had on improving public health. It features in the ANS Australian National Data Service uh, data impact stories, if you're interested in following that up. But it's a real reminder of why data is so important and the impact that it can have on the world. So Research Data Australia helps that by improving findability, citability and connection of data, which helps make more data more fair, which means more impact of research. So that is it for me. Um, I don't know, uh, Liz, if you can, I think I stopped showing screen and you hand it to Key. Excellent. Um, Keith, are you there?
Oh, but we might it's need you on mute. I'm muted. Yep. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll I'll be quiet now. The the floor is yours. Do you need me to make you a presenter? Yes, please. Then I can share my slides. Yes, let's see. Can you now see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, I would like to uh, like to build a little bit on on one of the uh, the fair uh, fair fair guiding principles, and uh, I would like to build on the principle F two. Uh, so the principle is uh, that data are described with rich discovery, uh, rich metadata, uh, but I'm going to make it a little bit more specific for today to talk about rich discovery metadata. So um, in this current period of lockdown and uh, sadly not being able to reach out to the, uh, the, the, the larger world out there, I do want to bring in a few international pictures at least to maybe to taunt us and tease us. It certainly taunted me. Um, so, because research is an international endeavour, it's all about making sure that research is findable, not only for Australians, but also for the whole world. So, when considering metadata are crucial to making sure that data is findable and reusable in the end. Um, it's not just the icing on the cake, it's actually a, a crucial underlying factor. So there is a huge array of data out there and trying to find the right data set as a researcher or as a potential reuser is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So this is where metadata comes in really handy as being a signpost to actually get you to the right data set. If nobody's gonna find your data, they're ne never going to be able to reuse it down the track. Metadata can also perform a lot of other functions down the track, but today I'm gonna to focus on the discoverability aspect and how metadata enables discoverability. So when describing your metadata, uh, when describing your data set, you need to uh, consider which metadata standard to use. And that will depend on the platform you're putting the data set in usually. So there are a huge array of metadata standards out there. Uh, there's a lovely visualization of the metadata universe. Uh, if you ever get a chance, have a look. It's, it's mind blowing. There's so many standards. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of those uh, are very uh, are lovely acronyms like uh, um, ISO 19115 and RIFCS, etc. I won't go into all these different standards and all these different details. And there is also a, a very useful metadata standards directory, which can be useful to map out which standards are there. There are reasons for these different metadata standards, and a lot of that is because uh, they are for specific disciplines or specific purposes. So imagine a data set about peers, lovely, beautiful birds, um, uh, threatened, endangered birds in, in, in New Zealand. Um, but when you're actually describing a data set about peers, um, you need to probably be more specific about what is really uh, what is really in the data set and for what use, uh, what purpose has the data been collected and what, what information is in there. So it could be more directed at the habitat of the peer and how it inter interacts with that habitat. Uh, but it could be on a completely different aspect uh, around the genomes and, and the genomes of the, of the keyers. So when describing your data set, and add a rich amount of data, uh, metadata inside it so that you can, you can identify what the data set is exactly about. And that's also really important to the researcher that wants to make use of the data set so that they can quickly interpret whether it's useful to them or where, whether it's a completely different type of data which is not relevant to them. Now, I mentioned earlier all these different metadata standards, and that's all very well. Uh, but if you put metadata in one specific standard, uh, it's going to be discoverable to those that are looking and understand the language of that standard and the language of that discipline. But it might not be understandable for somebody that's looking from a different perspective, a researcher that's using a different language or a different type of question. So for that, you need translations between these metadata standards to enable that it can be found through different routes. So we call that crosswalking, and it is actually possible um, to crosswalk between these metadata standards to make sure that information that's in one metadata standard gets carried across into another system, is also discoverable in another system, and then 
hurry across and get into another system. So for example, uh, you can have a data set in your local institutional repository. Uh, I've put up here Syro, Syro Adapt as an example, and um, that holds the, uh, the metadata in a specific metadata standard that gets moved across uh, to uh, Research Start Australia, where it's captured in RIVCS, and that then is also moved across uh, in, through schema.org and can also be found through Google Dataset Search. So that means that a researcher can find the data either by looking in the DAP or in Research Start Australia or in Google Dataset Search. Similarly, it might be oceanographic data, which uh, probably makes both best sense to be deposited in an ocean data portal. And that it goes again in a very specific discipline standard, and that will also be harvested by Google Dataset Search. So making sure it goes into the right repository using the appropriate metadata standard for discovery uh, makes it much more um, much more discoverable through. So what wrapping up? Make sure that you have well described meta, well described data with uh, rich um, metadata, so that enables the discoverability for a range of researchers in the relevant metadata standards and make sure that it's discoverable through these multiple platforms and portals. Okay, thank you. That was my uh, quick pitch. Awesome. Thanks very much, Keith. I'm going to hand over to Siobhan McCafferty now um, to talk to us about the glory of PIDs. Great, can everyone hear me? Excellent, cool. I've just managed to wrangle my microphone settings. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about PIDs and about DOIs. Can everyone see my screen as well? Yes, I'm yes, we can see. Seeing any waving, great, cool. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's get on my notes as well. So by means of introduction, um, so my name is John McCafferty, I'm a project manager at the ARDC and I work in a few areas um, and one of which is I am an avid PIDs enthusiast um, as I asked Liz to introduce myself. I think PIDs have a really quiet and powerful role in the plumbing of um, joined up data uh, and they're sometimes a bit of an unsung hero in FAIR data, particularly the F of FAIR. So, uh, I thought that I would talk you through the ARDC uh, identifier services and really concentrate on, on DOIs. Um, ARDC takes a really strong stance promoting and developing PIDs infrastructure and services. <coughs> For example, we, we bake PIDs into our national level services and ANCRIS infrastructure. We support and co-invest in programs that have a, a mandatory fair component for data. Um, we support AAF, uh, at, who are the Yorka Consortium Lead in Australasia. Um, and last but not least, we have this suite of PID services. And you can see that on, on the screen here, we've got DOIs, handles, IGSN, um, and RAIDs. And the most widely used of these uh, is our DOI service. So what is a DOI? Well, it's a unique digital identifier for objects, kind of does what it says on the tin. It's a persistent link to an object's location and they're used to facilitate discovery, citation, tracking of citation metrics. Uh, it's got six essential metadata elements. So identifier, title, creator, publisher, publication year and resource type. So that's not a lot of essential elements really. It's just enough to make it really flexible uh, and very, very useful. What do we use DOIs for? Uh, we can use it for a whole heap of things. Um, you might recognize them from being at the top of uh, published journals. For example, uh, the DOI at the bottom has, has an article. You can click on that and have a look. Um, you probably recognize the 10 dot as the, the beginning of all of the DOIs. Um, but it can also be used for research data sets uh, and collections that are in repositories. Um, also software and models, so it's, it's a digital identifier that can be used for digital only output. Um, also grey literature, 
so theses, reports, uh, conference papers, newsletters, creative works, um, preprints. This is really important as well in the world where journals are often expensive to access. Uh, technical standards. So the standard for DOIs is also accessible through DOI for the standard for DOIs. Uh, and specifications. Um, it can also be used for instruments. Uh, and this is a new area where things are kind of moving. So telescopes, synchrotrons, sequences, and I call them shiny fingertrons. Anything you like really can have a DOI attached for it. Um, should it have something, uh, should it have a DOI attached for it? That's a slightly different discussion. DOIs use handle technology. And you might have noticed a few screens back that we also offer a handle service. So um, handle uh, is an, an underlying um, PID service or, or infrastructure that's used globally. And DOI uses handles um, along with some additions to the handle standard. DOI is an international standard, um, which is really important for improving things like findability because if everyone's using the same standard, we know exactly how that's gonna work. It's overseen by, by the DOI Foundation. And DOIs are allocated locally by globally distributed reg registration authorities. So what that really means is there's an, an overarching um, governing structure and underneath it there is local or geographically uh, separate organisations that will allocate the DOIs. So for our purposes, the two organisations we need to talk about are Crossref and DataSite. Crossref is one of the organisations uh, that is within uh, Australia's geographical location um, and they do DOIs for scholarly and professional research content, so journal articles, books, conference proceedings, uh, reference linking and searchable metadata databases. So go and have a look at Crossref, really interesting stuff there, they do a lot of work. And Datasite is the other one. Datasite is uh, uh, it's also a not-for-profit um, and it, it works on research data and other research outputs. Um, both of these organisations work together to make sure that DOIs cover everything, but they do different parts of the everything. So how does the ARDC's DOI service work? So we work uh, by uh, providing two means of interface. One is a web interface and one is an API. Um, our DOIs come through data site in the main um, and we have a, an allocated amount of those and you'll use a web interface to make either a single DOI or use the API uh, plumbed into a, an appropriate um, platform, something like maybe a, a repository or maybe uh, some kind of uh, software that you're working with. Um, and possibly even for uh, repositories for publications within the university. Um, and that will have the API plumbed into it, so we can mint lots and lots of DOIs for you, and you can then allocate it to whatever is appropriate to allocate it to. <coughs> so that's how it works. That's what, uh, that's what you can use them for. Um, and if you have any more questions, please feel free to contact me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Siobhan. All right. Well, um, that is the that concludes our panelist mini session um, this morning or this afternoon, where wherever you are. Um, and now I'd like to open it up for a Q and A discussion. So if I can invite our panel to turn their um, mic video cameras on um, and also welcome Richard Ferris from um, Victoria who um, is also on hand to um, talk about some of the some of the intricacies of um, DOIs and um, repositories um, but what I so what I'd like to do is I'll go through some of the questions that people have popped into um, the question box so far and then um, and ask our illustrious panel uh, if you have more, please um, put them into the questions or the um, chat sections. I'll try and keep ahead of both of them. So um, let's see. Although there were a couple of there was a there was a question about is there a preferred hashtag for the Twitter discussion? That is, um, you may have seen that in our previous um, 
webinars, but if you can hashtag um, ARDC training or FAIR 101, um, they're the best hashtags to, those are the best hashtags to use. Now, there was a question about links to the metadata standards um, uh, when Keith was talking. And so we'll have, uh, we'll make these slides available so you can follow up um, on those links um, later on in the week. Um, hopefully we'll have those um, onto the Slack and onto the course materials website um, quite promptly. Um, uh, there's a comment on the Riley visualization of metadata standards is amazing, but most of the metadata schema standards there are not applicable to describe data sets, but other digital objects. Um, would anyone like to comment on this? Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think you're. I think that, that that's true to a certain extent, uh, although it also depends a little bit on what your definition of data is. And I think that is one where, uh, for example, um, the wide array of materials that are produced in humanities uh, um, do require also quite a wide array of underlying metadata standards. So think of moving images and uh, um, uh, audio recordings and artifacts, etc. They often do have quite different um, metadata standards and fields associated with them too. So. Um, Yes, the Riley does contain a huge range of uh, different uh, metadata standards, and some of them are, may not be directly applicable to research data. But there, then you'll, if you take quite a broad view of research data, you might find that there's more included than you would expect in first instance. Awesome, thanks, Keith. Um, also, another perhaps more of a comment um, rather than a question, uh, but that's the order they've come in. So I'm going to I'm going to go with that. I love the comparison of Natasha Simons of FAIR data principles as IKEA instructions. I have one for metadata. They are like toothbrushes. Everybody thinks that is a very good idea, but everyone wants to use their own. And I'm updating it to pandemic times that metadata are like the mask. Um, which is very lovely. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, that's, that's really awesome. <laughs> just for those who, who don't, uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, just to hear the, for those who don't know the IKEA uh, analogy, I, I said that the fair data principles are like opening an IKEA flat pack. You know, you read the instructions and you think it's going to be easy, but once you start, it's actually a lot harder and it takes a lot longer and is much more complicated than you originally thought. Um, but one solution I've, I've kind of thought, I've come to think of FAIR as a continuum rather than a little checklist of do these instructions because there's just different degrees in which you can implement FAIR. So conceptually, I think it's it's good to think of it that way. All right, thank you. Um, can you talk a little more about how the language is translated between different collections to be findable for researchers from different disciplines? Anyone like to take that one on? Yeah, happy to talk about that a little bit. So, um, in different uh, in different discipline repositories and different dis discipline systems, they they often use different discipline metadata standards and uh, there are actually nowadays uh, machine uh, machine actionable sort of crosswalks between the metadata standards so which, which basically says okay in in ISO 19115 this field is described as this and that translates to this field in a more generic uh, metadata standard like schema.org or rifcs uh, it sounds dead easy and if it was really that easy then it would just be one on one uh, in practice, it can be a little bit more complicated because one field can map to several fields in a different uh, different metadata standard, or it might need conversion, etc. But uh, that the basic principle is that uh, there's an XSLT between these two uh, metadata standards, and that will actually allow for a translation from one metadata standard to another. And we've done a series of those to enable harvesting from a number of repositories into Research Data Australia. And those uh, crosswalks are actually available uh, publicly if you're interested. And if you would need a crosswalk, please get in touch and uh, happy to have a chat to see, uh, see if there's something already available. Awesome, thanks Keith. Okay, so um, we've got quite a few questions now coming in about DOIs and um, some of the, and, and ranking Google data sets um, or ranking the, 
Google data set. Ooh. So um, let me move towards that. How how do you um, the first question I have is, say multiple organisations have ownership of an asset, how would a DOI be cre created, i.e. which organisation would be re represented in the DOI? Perhaps I can comment on that, Liz. Um, projects that span multiple institutions are complicated around managing the data. So one of the things we recommend is that at the start of those kind of projects, the parties should make clear particularly around the data, who has responsibility for what. So you don't want, say, if five universities are working on a project together, they all mint the DOI for the data set. Some, they should agree as a group um, who should take responsibility for that activity and who should um, be curating that data in the long term. So one, it's likely one institution would hold the data and then make it available for everybody in the partnership. So they, they really need to agree uh, on who's going to take responsibility. And so there should be some kind of contract uh, that outlines the roles and responsibilities of each party. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm just yeah, so getting... just, to, just draw that out slightly more. <laughs> that is, it is ideal to just have one data set, one DOI for that data collection, even if it's held, even if it's referenced across multiple institutions, and that it would resolve to the one place of that whoever has decided to be the home caretaker or the lead institution there. I'm just going to um, skip over to a very recent question um, about distributed data sets then in that case. Could one DOI be used for, for this, even though there may be subset data sub data sets within is it does it is there a hierarchy required uh i don't think there's a hierarchy required but it's useful to be able to well you you can decide the level of granularity by which you want to it's really think about data um, the dois are there to cite data so at what level is your data best cited at, at the collection level like the whole level or at different subsets of the data. And if it's both of those things, then you can legitimately have different DOIs for each of those things. And they all resolve to different, well, they all resolve to a landing page. You could potentially nest them all, but they have to resolve to a landing page that describes those things so that when someone cites it, it goes back to that data set. So just have a think about the granularity there and the relationship would exist. You can make relationships in the metadata of the DOIs to sort of say this data is related to that data. Mm. And that's also in Research Data Australia, you can do that nested collections thing as well. Great. And um, I'll, I'll add just a little bit more on there about uh, working data. So DOIs in particular are often used for um, end output data. So this is a data set which is attached to uh, a publication, for example, and that will have a DOI. Often though, there's working data underneath it that people are still using for their research and it's changing so much that a DOI is not appropriate for it. So in, in a way, it's horses to courses. Is this something that's finished and whole as a product that people need to be able to access for citation? Um, or is this working data that I'm still currently using? And something like a handle will be more appropriate for continually evolving data, also because it's got less compulsory metadata attached to it. So that those six fields for DOI, uh, while they're not, not a lot, sometimes you can't satisfy that. Uh, so you'll need to accept that you can't put a DOI on that data set yet. It's still working data. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what prevents duplication in this so thinking about um, other uh, thinking about making a choice about when you're putting a DOI on something for example if a DOI is minted for an output by a repository but that same output is also given to and launched by a different publishing platform which in turn mints a DOI um, I'm just going to add to this question so how do you sort out that kind of spaghetti you don't. <laughs> Arm wrestling. <laughs> the messiness of data. <laughs> Sorry, guys, there's no easy solution to that. If you think about ResearchGate, where a lot of researchers put their data, that issues DOIs 
he can't stop that sorry um it's just going to happen uh ideally we we don't want that because you want again it comes back to the citation you want to be able to link back to that one data set but it's really difficult to you can't really prevent that proliferation but i think at the start of a research project if you're careful and you work out this is where the home of the data is going to be and we're going to have one doi for that and that's the one that's going to link back to the article then that's the ideal situation so it's about being careful and, and checking and being a responsible citizen like that but you can't really really stop it in reality right liz maybe responsible I could... citizen Maybe I could add to that a little bit. Would would a project want multiple DOIs for its data or a single one? Would they? We we prefer to have a single DOI for a data set because then the citations can collect around that DOI. If a project has lots of DOIs for the same thing, then those citations are all scattered across all those different DOIs, and it's more work to bring them all together. Um, so our, our strong preference is that one DOI is minted for a single data set. Mm. Um, one more thing on top of that is this culture of uh, ownership of data. So if one person owns a the data, then they can put a DOI in it, which is problematic because realistically in research, it's not normally one person doing the research. It's fairly rare for large data sets to have one, one researcher working on them. So I would like to just put a little grist in the mill but, and, and say, should we, why are we continuing with this model of, oh, you own it, you can put a DOI on it, institution or the lab or whatever, perhaps that's more appropriate for them to have ownership over that data and therefore it's theirs to put the, the, um, the DOI on. That's very interesting, Siobhan. It, um, I'm going to jump over to a question about um, uh, looking at the personal uh, level or you know on somebody's CV um, uh, it is much more beneficial if people cite my data my papers rather than my data therefore when posting my data online I ask users to cite the paper that discusses the data collection slash analysis method rather than the data DOI itself um, I doubt that people will cite both data DOI and the paper if I ask them so what is your proposal? When will data citations be equivalent to article citations when it comes to my own CV? And what should I do in the meantime to ensure data sharing is most beneficial to my career? I think that's really, really common. Sorry, I'm going to jump in and be a hog again. Um, I skip ahead to it as well. Um, but yeah, I think that is actually the the challenge with data citation is that it is cited in really different ways. And it's not just, I cite, I cite the article, instead of the data is really, really common. Um, and then the article itself can contain links to the data or the metadata record can, that the journal creates can contain links to the data, especially if it's got an integration with a repository that provides that DOI. So there's more and more integrations happening between publishers of articles and data repositories. So you can say here is the article and here is the underlying data. But uh, it does make tracking the, in, the citation count of data very, very tricky. And sometimes it's cited in text and often it doesn't have a DOI, the data. It's just like a link. It can be a link to a website. I'm sorry to say that a lot of data is just dumped on a website. It's not in a repository. Um, and it can, you know, a lot of it's in supplementary section of journals. It's all very different practices. And we're, we are moving towards a world where um, it, we are improving that practice. Um, but it's it's gradual it's not like you sort of say here's the fair principles and magic happens it's going to take a little while to get there so i think the practice that that you're doing in that example does reflect general practice at the moment i don't think there's anything wrong with that um, but i think we we are moving to better guidelines from publishers about how to cite data and when to do it and how to link it through the metadata records i don't know if anyone else wants to add to that I'm actually going um, to, I'm sorry, I, I feel oh. that I probably need to wrap this up 
at this stage because I'm aware we've gone over time and I do appreciate that um, people have um, that that they're only prepared for a 45 minute webinar and I um, they've got quizzes and activities to to fit into their busy schedules as well um, as much as I would love to keep talking about this and answer all of the questions um, so I'm feeling quite an internal conflict as well um, we will undertake if you haven't if your question hasn't been answered answered we'll undertake to answer that and put those um, Q and A's um, up on the slack channel um, and a link to that on the course materials website as well by the end of this week so um, I apologize if we haven't been able to get to your question just yet but we'll respond to all of those in um, in the fullness of this week if I can say um, thank you very much um, Natasha and Keith and Siobhan and Richard for being here um, with us today um, and answering all these questions. And um, thank you everybody in the course who's joined us um, for giving this a go, Red Hot Go, and I look forward to seeing you on the Slack. Um, if you, um, there'll be a little um, post-webinar survey that happens as soon as the, um, this webinar ends. We're really interested in how this is going for you. So please, it's very short. Um, please fill that out. Let us know how you're going. And I encourage you to jump onto the Slack and um, uh, dig a bit deeper into some of these discussions and uh, introduce yourself and get to meet other people here. So uh, looking forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank Thanks for letting Thank us you. talk about things we love most.